Hello everyone, my name is Christine and I'm representing Airnet today. Welcome on our long-awaited horticulture webinar and today I'm not alone here. So we have here our dear friend, um, horticulture expert, agronom, um, Synergy Solutions, Andrew Stokes with me. Hello. Andres is here today to share the latest insights of uh, greenhouse uh, monitoring and uh, how data-driven dri decisions can improve the daily life of any of the growers. So today I think that we will dive into various topics, uh, touch-basing aspects of climate monitoring, including the temperature, distribution in the greenhouse and how it impacts the fruit, fruit growth. Also, I think that tracking the biomass gain, if I'm not mistaken, yes. right? So plant weight and the role of electric, electrical, electrical, right? Electrical conductivity um, and irrigation topics. Um, we will start with the presentation of Andres and it will be followed by the Q&A session afterwards, but you can write all your questions in the chat throughout the webinar, whenever that pops out. So, let's oh. start. Yeah. Hello, <coughs> my name is Andres Stooks. Uh, today I would like you to tell and describe a little bit of what we are doing and tell what we have found out in our uh, everyday life. Uh, a little bit about uh, us. Um, we are working now in six countries covering more than 30 compartments. Um, now we have shifted our focus more to different regions, but still we are focused mainly in tomato crop, on cucumber crop. Uh, so we are working uh, with uh, two major crops, cucumber, tomato, having some insights also on lettuce and on strawberry. Um, so what we do in everyday basis, we are monitoring plant biomass gain and climate conditions in the greenhouse. Uh, uh, we do it mainly with RNET sensors. So in every greenhouse with what we work, uh, they have a set of RNET sensors installed. I will show them later on and I will also try to explain why they are needed and what's the benefits of uh, having all those sensors there. Um, if we talk uh, uh, why you need to add additional sensors in your greenhouse, because the con uh, concept is, goes as such, you have a climate computer which is steering your uh, climate in a greenhouse, uh, it, it's doing its work pretty well, so you already know what's going on, uh, but in reality is that we know only uh, part of what's going on in the greenhouse, we know only temperature in one spot and most importantly in most of the cases, we don't know how the plant reacts and how it interacts with the climate. So what we need to do is we need to measure the plant responses because at the end of the day, we are selling only part of the plant, which is uh, generative biomass, which are fruits. We don't sell leaves, unfortunately, if it's not tobacco or other crops. And uh, so that's why we need to focus on uh, gathering more, more data. So from that data, if we interpret it right, we get information. From that one further, we build our knowledge on how the crop responds uh, to some of the climate parameters. So we have insights how those, inter how those parameters are interconnected, intertwined, and from that one we can build further how to steer the crop in desired, uh, in desired direction. So in many cases uh, I've heard the story that we don't need any sensors, we already know what to do, and that might be true in, uh, with really experienced growers, with the, but with the starting growers, the ones who start the crops and they start to grow the first time in their life, having more insight in uh, plant responses is uh, uh, really good. So uh, when we measure, usually we measure climate. So why we need to measure the climate, we need to uh, measure uh, what in green, so what is going on in the greenhouse, what's the temperature, what's air humidity, because, because it has direct impact on our plant responses. Uh, we need to measure all the disturbances outside and inside to steer our inside uh, uh, climate by influencing air temperature, air humidity. Now with the no, new systems of ventilation, also air flow, which affects the biomass uh, gain and photosynthesis. So, and we need to get insights in all of it. So, and uh, that's why I would start with, uh, uh, with climate and I would I will dive deep, uh, dive a little bit deeper in uh, climate set points versus realization in greenhouse because when we have 
climate uh, computer, we put in temperature, we put in humidity, and we hope that it is going as we expect. But uh, there is that thing that uh, ignorance is a bliss, as less you know, as better you sleep. Uh, when I started my career in, uh, many years ago, I thought that I know everything and uh, I was really in, in peak uh, of this mountain of stupidity. So then I, when I have started to measure and compare in, other, in different greenhouses uh, what's going on, then I went uh, through, how to say, hell of uh, knowledge where uh, you understand that all your previous beliefs was uh, wrong. So, and uh, for that one, is really important to know what is going, in, going on in your greenhouse. Because the uh, usual process of plant growing is that you have your climate set points, uh, you have your expectations how your plant will grow, how, how the crop should look like, but then you start to inter interpret it and then you see, well, my plant is uh, growing differently than I have been, that I have been expected expecting. So that's why it's good to make the temperature map, because in a temperature map you can see the differences in the greenhouse uh, on area, on the plot of uh, greenhouse, and you already can foresee uh, upcoming problems like with fungal diseases if it's too humid and, uh, and uh, too cold, and with too, change, uh, too quickly changing uh, temperatures and humidities. So, and as example, uh, we have a, a greenhouse with seven hectares. I have nicely drawn two dots on a map. I will show you later on why they are, why they are there. There are eight uh, greenhouse climates. All the climates have the same set points. So what we expect that they will all grow uh, the same. So the climate realization will be the same and plants will grow the same. But uh, it turns out in reality that uh, actually there are quite a big difference in uh, greenhouse temperature from uh, climate to climate. And that greenhouse Temperature increase also influences the plant temperature increase. Uh, on a right side graph, you see the set point uh, and uh, ventilation, uh, so the heating set point and ventilation set point and uh, realized temperature. Uh, on the left side, you see that in a, so where's my pointer? It's there and we go back to pointer. So this is a uh, climate settings and how the previous shows the climate realization, but in reality in green, as you see that temperature difference is up to four degrees. So, and uh, when you do the plant registration without measuring the temperature next to those plants, then you end up in a situation that you look at your plants from the plant monitoring and there are those two dots what I've drawn there on the map that uh, in one case you have plants which are more thick, with the thicker trusses, uh, lower growing truss, more vegetative plant, but also with not even a fruit uh, setting in a, uh, uh, on the lower trusses. And then on the right side you have a plant which is thinner, more generative. And then it, uh, when you start to interpret your plant registration, it, uh, it happens like in a story when uh, four blind men start to describe the elephant. So it was because of the irrigation, it's because of the heating, it's because of the air exchange or screening, but actually it is because you haven't measured the climate around that plant, what you have been measuring in plant registration. So for that one, it's important to measure the climate next to the plants, which you later on uh, want to use as a set point for the steering your climate further. Then uh, another topic on uh, climate uniformity. So another example in climate uniformity is five hectare greenhouse also, where we have noticed that there is uneven fruit ripening by time. Uh, and especially in the beginning of the crop season every year, uh, there have been corners in the greenhouse where fruits get mature uh, like one week later than another part, although the plants have been sown in one day and uh, everything have been done exactly the same. So what we decided there is to create a heat map. We installed 14 uh, sensors to see uh, how, it, how it have been going. And also there we noticed uh, quite big differences in uh, temperatures. So especially in the night temperatures, so night temperature can vary by, by five degrees and also minimal temperature during the night is uh, varying by four degrees. So, and uh, for that one, we have found out where the cold spots are in greenhouse and we made all the possible actions to uh, minimize it. So, and we made it by controlling the screen gap. So the screen gap is the important 
uh, tool because uh, I will share later on in slides cold air so the warm air cools down and um, above the screen and then it rolls down to the coldest uh, to the lowest part in the greenhouse and then it drops on the uh, plant heads and uh, it's also important to divide greenhouse rich in parts so you you create smaller uh, cold pockets and so there is no such big influence at the end of the greenhouse uh, so how it looked and uh, uh, so where what we measured is that average greenhouse temperature was uh, different uh, so there have been difference up to two degrees in 24 average uh, uh, greenhouse temperature so that means that plants in a warmer part they have been growing quicker and faster than in another one and also we have seen a really big difference in water pressure deficit average so that's average 24 hour uh, water pressure deficit so that means the plant transpiration potential so and depends on the time of the day when this uh, difference in uh, water pressure happens uh, that steers your plant or to into too generative or too vegetative action. So you can get or too fat plants or too thin plants with uh, stretched leaves, stretched stems, and uh, aborting uh, fruits on the truss. So now we more and more use uh, uh, RTR, so radiation temperature ratio, where we have our base temperature, and especially when we grow with natural light only. Uh, we base our 24 average temperature based on light somewhat we have achieved and uh, in this case uh, with measurements in the greenhouse we see that also there the RTR is uh, really off from uh, compartment to compartment uh, but most importantly uh, what we have uh, looked at was uh, lowest temperature in the greenhouse uh, which have been happening for 15 minutes in a row and there we see that in some places uh, greenhouse temperature have been dropping up to 9 degrees and uh, like 9, 10 degrees and uh, tomato chilling uh, happens already at 10 degrees and you can get inevitable damage uh, on, a, on the fruits but uh, those temperature differences are leading to the differences in, uh, uh, in fruit growth so the fruit is growing based on temperature uh, so it ripens based on temperature but it gains its weight based on the uh, light sum which every individual fruit gets so you can scan a QR code in the corner of this slide. You will get to the publication where this information is derived from. So, and those difference in the, uh, those difference in the greenhouse that we have seen is actually uh, the cause why we have different uh, fruit ripening speed and different size of the fruits in different uh, compartments. And that, uh, and too cold temperature what we had in the greenhouse is actually causing the fruit damage. Uh, and this fruit damage really looks like now. Uh, quite popular virus what we would not like to see the Tober F virus uh, but in this case we tested it negative but still we have this cold damage and uh, it should not be mistaken with Tober F so it's better to have a cold feed and test negative that it's not Tober F but it's also is better to keep your tomatoes warm and don't get, don't get them too cold to prevent this cold damage so if you have made your heat map and if you have seen that there is a difference in the greenhouse temperature from end to end of the greenhouse. Um, you could also scan QR code on this slide and you would uh, be lead to the uh, Hit New Retail book in Dutch. So you could read that book. I would really suggest you to read it and learn it from your heart. Uh, that's the book of the basic greenhouse physics and uh, plant responses to the, to the greenhouse environments. But the best thing uh, to do in this case is uh, to divide the greenhouse ridge in uh, multiple small pockets. So in our practice we have been dividing that one of those uh, pockets is around uh, 35 meters. So in this case we have seen that the greenhouse uniformity comes up from uh, 21 to 16. That might be quite, quite a difficult, uh, uh, quite extreme example. But we have seen that the uh, temperature difference from uh, one end to another one in 24 average temperature have been from 18 to 0.5 to 18 degrees. So 24 average temperature is evening out. And the night temperature differs by one degree. So that's quite simple solution what you can do. You can do it or with plastic foil or with screen leftovers, whatever. You just cut the ridge in uh, parts and, and that would do the trick for you. So my insights and takeaways, what I would like to take uh, with you, it just little, little rephrased a uh, good phrase, is that uh, it's better to have serenity to accept the things what you 
what you cannot change and just live with them and uh, uh, work with your plans uh, and you just accept that you cannot change courage to change those things what you can the wider reach do the pruning differently in the places where it's colder or warmer wisdom to know the difference analyze how do they differ and then enough sensors to measure those uh, difference in the greenhouse that would be the best thing to do so uh, plant biomass and uh, uh, what we see the plant biomass is a really important uh, really important tool uh, to get you from uh, zero to hero uh, if you never have grown the plant or you start a new crop you start a new uh, a new variety then you should start to work with plant biomass because there are simple ways how to get to the result in a, in one year um, and I would like to go briefly through the cru uh, cucumber yield planning uh, we have done it in a, in a greenhouse in Latvia uh, when we started first to work with LEDs um, LED is a new topic in many countries uh, many companies are moving from HPS to LED or starting from non-lit crops uh, to lighted crops and uh, in this case you would uh, install the plant scales to monitor the plant biomass gain and plant weight and also you could uh, foresee the problems uh, which would come uh, with, uh, with, with, with changes in plant weight so usually what we start is uh, we plan our weekly light sum in our case uh, it was that we have been planning every week to have 210 moles uh, it, it would be good to ask from your seed supplier or a breeder uh, what is the light use efficiency for the crop like light use efficiency here this 22 grams per mole it stands uh, uh, as light, light use efficiency so that means uh, uh, this that means how many uh, how many grams of production you can use uh, you can grow per one mole of light uh, and it is better now to measure your light in micromoles and calculate it in moles uh, because different producers have different light outputs and it's not anymore enough to measure it in watts and it's not also wise to express it in joules so when you know your uh, light sum when you know your uh, light use efficiency you go to uh, you go to uh, to your calculation in our in our case it was that we have planned that we can have minimum 4.56 kilos uh, per square meter per week uh, from that one we have calculated uh, how many fruits we should keep on the plant uh, so in our case it was uh, because we are limited on fruits our fruit size is 250 grams so that's why we can keep 18 fruits on plant uh, that means that if we have 3.56 plants uh, that's our planting density we should keep minimum five fruits per week and because our plant is growing uh, six leaves uh, per week uh, that means our pruning strategy should be five fruits in one fruit out and from that one is that uh, our fruit load shouldn't be more than uh, 12 fruits and that means that every week we should add five fruits on the plant so that means by pruning we remove one so five fruits are added and we harvest five fruits so from that one we know what should be our average plant uh, load of fruits uh, last year we made uh, measurement uh, measurements of every fruit on the plant for uh, for whole months uh, in months of April and May so the graph what you see here that's uh, measurement of fruit day per, per day and you should look that uh, this fruit in that day is that, that fruit on that day so from that one we can calculate what is our average uh, fruit weight on the plant so this have been always measured before harvesting so knowing how many fruits you add and how much you take them off you know also in how many days they should grow so that is also determining your fruit load that is determining your fruit weight on the plant we have been measuring also every leaf uh, on a plant so then we know what is the allowed leaf weight on the plant so we measured leaf blade and leaf petiole we came to that weight and as every week we add six leaves on a, in the head of the plant we remove six leaves from the bottom of the plant so then we know uh, what should be our uh, actual plant load so that we know that every individual plant can be from uh, 1.3 kilo to 1.7 kilo 
which means that uh, from that one I also could know how much weight we should see on the scale so we know how many scales there are. Uh, what you should keep in mind that uh, leaf weight is really variety dependent. If you want to grow uh, based on biomass gain, you should do some homework on measuring your plant which is growing. You can just disassemble piece by piece, m write down every, uh, every fruit position, every fruit weight, uh, every leaf position, every leaf weight, and then from that one you can calculate what will be the normal uh, plant weight. And then you will have your guidelines for, uh, your guidelines for the plant weight. And uh, when you grow your plant, or if you have grown it, let's say, for a few weeks, uh, then you do uh, plant biomass distribution calculation, and that we have done by, uh, by every time when we have harvested fruit, we write it down as a fruit harvest. When we have harvested leaf, we write it down as a leaf harvest. From that one, we know our uh, biomass distribution in fresh plant fresh weight uh, biomass distribution in fruit or leaf that is necessary to determine your maximum and minimum plant weight what you should see on the scale uh, because if your plant grows uh, so if, if you have higher plant weight on the scales then it should be by your good calculation that means that you have cucumber fruits which are not growing at the pace as they should be growing and you have risk of uh, fruit abortion and uh, yeah, you basically have useless uh, weight which is not growing efficiently enough and if it's too low then you don't have enough fruit load and if you have uh, enough uh, uh, plants on a scale or you have more than one scale in the greenhouse then you also can see the differences um, in the biomass gain per different climates and always you can recalculate uh, this biomass gain in uh, uh, grams per mole on a daily base growth. So, and uh, as a result, uh, from all those measurements, uh, as we are monitoring plant weight over the period of time, we know the time delta, uh, and then we sum it up, and then we have biomass gain per day. And then because in the previous slide I, show you, I showed you the biomass distribution in fruits, if I know my biomass gain per unit of uh, area, uh, like I have gained here 820 grams per square meter per day, then my weekly yield should be around 4.8 kilos, because in seven days I will get uh, 5.7 kilos of uh, total biomass, and from that 185% will be harvested as a fruit. So I have already possibility to check whether I will fulfill my yield prognosis. So it's already like alarming me if I have too low plant weight, there's not enough uh, biomass gain, I will not get my fruits. So uh, uh, we started uh, this growing with the scales in Latvia uh, in 2019. Uh, 2018 was total failure when we switched to LEDs. We harvested only 123 kilos from promised 165. In 2019 we learned the first tricks on how to use the scales. Uh, so in, a, in the first crop we we're learning what to do. On the second part, we were already knowing what we are doing. And then in 2019, we actually went above the promised uh, light use efficiency, above the promised kilos by the LED producer. And there the things that we learned was that uh, air movement is important if you have LEDs and if you grow your cucumber with LEDs because the uh, plants, so because the lamps doesn't produce so much heat, you need or heat more, which is uh, lowering relative humidity, or you need to move the air around to pull the water away from the leaf, so you need to decrease the leaf boundary layer. And since we started to use our uh, air circulation system, uh, we have air and energy system there, we started to get more, um, uh, more transpiration and more photosynthesis and more biomass gain. We have started to plan, so we, were, we have been planning our yield based on a light use efficiency, how many fruits we need to have. We have been looking, okay, now the plant weight is too low, there's not enough uh, biomass gain. So uh, for sensors, what you can use for plant biomass monitoring, so those ones are definitely must-haves. If you start the new crop or you start a new variety, all those sensors make perfect sense uh, why to use them. Like now we widely use uh, subflow measurement, uh, subflow measurement kit, kit um, we will have a presentation about it uh, 
uh, later. Uh, now we do it on tomato, uh, water in, water out. We also have uh, some slides about it later on. Uh, also stem diameter uh, is a good sensor to use because that one is showing you uh, how much uh, your water is suffering the stress. I will touch that one also later. So the way it is a must have at every greenhouse, uh, power sensor is definitely must have. EC will help you understand how your plant uh, takes up the water or it's because it's not available or because EC is too high. Uh, plant temperature sensor will allow you to see the water pressure deficit. So that's between how much uh, there is water pressure deficit in the, so the saturation pressure of the air and saturation pressure of uh, uh, of the plant, so that's the plant, how, how good it is cooling itself, so all those sensors have a perfect sense. And um, so the plant weight, as I already mentioned, is the most valuable uh, tool to have. And we are harvesting uh, only part of the biomass, that's fruit, and we're always trying to maximize the fruit, uh, fruit gain. And we are also, if the plant stops to grow, then mostly uh, this biomass uh, gain decrease is because the fruit is not growing because it makes the major part of the total biomass gain. So you should uh, look at it carefully. Uh, there are ways uh, how to interpret uh, biomass. So far until 2020 we have been looking at the biomass as cumulative biomass gain per day, which is uh, also a good tool to, uh, to monitor it, but you may miss out uh, some details. Um, uh, we have a good, good example of bad examples. We have greenhouse which doesn't follow our strategy. We have a changing uh, plant temperature, air temperature, and water and, and air humidity. So definitely there are climate computers which are better than others. So and for that one, uh, we came to the new way of interpretation of biomass, and that is uh, interpretation in a biomass change, a biomass gain per unit of time. So in this case, uh, just a little bit explaining what it is. Uh, if we take all time at which we are looking at the plant growth, we take the plant average weight, uh, we take biomass gain per day, and we calculate the average biomass gain per unit of biomass. So that's like if you take the loan, that's uh, interest on principle. You have some money what you have taken from the bank and you need to pay every month some interest on it. So that's the same. You have, let's say, 20 kilos of plants per scale, and from that one you're getting 20% per, uh, per day. And the, what we are looking now at is uh, how does the biomass gain is changing per day, per change in humidity. I would uh, really appreciate if you will write later on the questions, and most probably you will have questions about this graph. Uh, it is quite a busy graph, but uh, basically what it says is that uh, when you have changing air humidity, your biomass is fluctuating with it. So there are moments when your plant is drying out, so you go below those 20% what you have been normally getting per day, and you are later on pushing the water in, which is uh, also not good. So the best uh, way how to grow is that it's a stable biomass gain with less changes. Uh, also by interpreting per unit of time, uh, you also see that where you are temperature limited or where you are humidity limited, like you see that in the morning the humidity deficit is lower, that's why the biomass gain is higher. In the afternoon, at the same light conditions, the humidity deficit is higher, but the plant biomass gain uh, at, the same, uh, at the same temperature, at the same light intensity, but at the changed uh, humidity deficit is actually lower. So also there you see that yeah, humidity is a driving force for the plant gain. And especially it's visible in, a, in the next day, in the morning, humidity deficit low, biomass gain high. In the afternoon, same amount of light, humidity deficit high, biomass gain lower. So it's better to look at the biomass gain and the plant grows as change per unit of time, per unit of other parameters. So where the stem diameter plays a crucial role, if you go with uh, uh, plant weight only, and uh, the green graph here represents the plant weight. So then when the sun comes out, and especially I made this graph a little bit smaller in scale, so when sun comes out and there's around 600 watts per square meter, 
uh, you see that at the peak of the day, at some moment of time, the biomass uh, stops increasing and so there is a drop in biomass. And also at the same time, if you measure the stem diameter, then you can explain why it is uh, decreasing. And usually it would be that if you see that stem, uh, that plant biomass is decreasing. So that means that we are losing water from the leaf. So leaf is losing to gore. If you couple your your setup, uh, sensor setup with thermal camera or with visual camera, you would see that your leaves are sagging down. So they're losing to gore. So they are kind of not wilting, but just uh, bending down. But then when you start to see that uh, the stem diameter is decreasing, uh, that's already the sign that you need to shade because that is uh, meaning that you are losing water from inner buffer in the plant. So because the plant have uh, outer layer and then inside you have this, uh, in tomato plant, you have this white spongy stuff which is filled with water, so it's the plant, in, plant internal water buffer. So if the stem diameter increases, that means the plant is missing water. So it's not critical, but that means that in the plants which are already weaker, they will get even more weaker. And then you see that in an afternoon when the sun goes down and when the water pressure deficit decreases, then you see the plant is regaining uh, its diameter and the reserves are filled up. Then also by stem diameter, you could see in the afternoon if there is an excessive spike in a stem diameter when the humidity deficit is going down or you're cooling down too quickly. So that is uh, the moments when you're making overpressure in, uh, in a plant and we have linked uh, this overpressure with the blossom and rot appearance and with a gray wall. So mostly uh, after those periods when we had uneven climate with uneven uh, uh, biomass gain and stem diameters, uh, it happens at truss number three and four. You see that uh, there is where your uh, fruit pro uh, those fruit problems start to form like blossom and rot and uh, gray wall. So moving forward, um, I already mentioned to you about uh, uh, about subflow sensors, what we have been using now. Uh, then if, so sorry for a busy graph, I have been famous uh, for too busy graphs and too difficult to understand, but uh, that's not my problem. That's your problem that you don't understand, right? So temperature and uh, subflow in the top truss. So if you draw the plant, uh, it have many leaves and then usually we have trusses until uh, we have leaves until truss number six and now we are measuring uh, top leaf so which is or directly below uh, the flowering truss or a little bit above the flowering truss uh, that's the subflow uh, which one it is yeah that's the subflow to the leaf and that's the sub subflow out from the leaf so this is a uh, net radiation. So we are measuring radiation on top of the plant, so incoming and outgoing radiation. And uh, there we see that during the night, so when we have all zero, a little bit below zero net radiation, so that means the plant is losing the energy. Uh, the sap flow to the leaf and out of the leaf is uh, uh, close to each other, so that means that there is little transpiration and most of the water which comes into the plant is going out of the plant. So we are doing the unloading from the top leaf. But then as soon as we turn the lights on, and here you see this famous spike of turning LEDs on, uh, that first it starts at high intensity and it drops down. So at that moment, plant takes more water to the leaf, but there is less leaf, uh, less transpiration out of the leaf. So, and by measuring the subflow in your plant, at the head of the plant, you could nicely explain at which moment your leaf to burn happens, but because we have uh, found out that uh, this leaf to burn, what you have, it's mostly uh, in the morning time when you switch from night, from the high uh, humidity or low humidity deficit to high temperature, high transpiration, and plant needs to transpirate, but there is nothing to transpirate because it haven't been taking water up whole night. And then during the day, when you see the temperature fluctuations, uh, you also see that uh, the plant is following, so the leaf is following the trend. And as uh, water is going in the leaf, if we, if we take the average, every fluctuation which is going in the leaf and which cannot be transpirated is actually expressed as the water which is coming out from the leaf, so that you also can uh, take as a fluctuations in the pressure in the plant. Then in the morning, uh, which is also good to see with this uh, net radi radiation measurement is that 
when you open the screen, if you open your screen too early, so actually this net change in uh, radiation is also changing the water flow. So basically because the plant is now losing the energy, somehow it's also less, uh, it's taking less water up. So there is a nice dip in uh, water uptake. If we go to what happens in the middle of the plant, same plant, only different leaf. It's a middle layer where there is less influence of the light. Uh, same temperature, same everything. And there we should go to uh, subflow in the truss and subflow out from the truss. And I just, I have made them a little bit wider so you can see uh, what's going on there. So this one is, uh, uh, this one have less fluctuations by the temperature because there are also less influences of radiation. So incoming uh, subflow is changing, uh, but uh, it's actually more influenced by the transpiration than by the water which is coming in. So if there is change in water, humi uh, in air humidity, the plant is uh, transpirating more water transport to the leaf is more or less the same. But then on the bottom leaf, it is that it is more related to the temperature and uh, it is also related because we are cooling down, we are heating up with the heating pipes and that, uh, that leaf is actually more following, so the subflow in the middle leaf is more following uh, the air temperature because it is more most isolated of the light. So that leaf gets around 20 micromoles of light in average per leaf blade. So there's no in influence of uh, fluctuations in the, in the light some, but there's more influence uh, in fluctuations in uh, humidity. But uh, think about the topic about the subflow. We should make another uh, webinar and uh, tell about it a little bit more. So the uh, role of EC uh, I have been already showing those slides in previous presentations, but they are good slides and why should I f look for new ones because they are happening and again and again. This is already uh, prepared. So uh, the measurements that we have made uh, with EC increase uh, in period of time, uh, we see that uh, our biomass decrease in, uh, so we, we have decreased increase of biomass. So if we zoom in in this, in this uh, in this period of time, so when EC have been increased, uh, we see that uh, before increase, the biomass gain have been happening flat. There have been no changes in uh, there have been no changes in stem diameter. The, the biomass have been increasing flat, and every irrigation didn't made any difference. But at high EC, uh, when substrate was already uh, EC of six and uh, uh, we have been irrigating with 3.1 well, where, where delta was abo above 1 EC which is already bad. Uh, we have seen that there have been uh, a lot of fluctuations in biomass gain and uh, that is it real deal that it is uh, affecting the pressure in the plant. Uh, you see that increases in plant weight, the rapid increase what we see here uh, is also coupled with the changes in stem diameter. So uh, if you see that also your stem gets pumped up, this is the moment when you create a pressure in the plant. And uh, as a consequence, after five weeks after this accident, we had a, uh, we had a gravel, uh, more expressed gravel on, a, on a tomato fruits. So I would really watch out uh, for it. it uh, you, you can see it already on the plant scales, uh, but if you have the stem diameter, you have a nice coupling of uh, what's happening in, uh, in the plant. So, after we have decreased EC, uh, we have seen that, so since we have an increase, we have seen that also the biomass gain have increased. So we have been missing out the biomass increase over the night uh, when the EC was the highest. Still there happened the transpiration because of the, uh, because we are heating, that was winter time. And uh, since we decreased EC, since we increased the water availability for the plant, also biomass increased. And if you express in, a, in a regular numbers, those 60 grams of, uh, Biomass increase per square meter uh, calculated over 75%, which minimal goes in fruits for tomato. Uh, let's say you have 10 hectare greenhouse, that comes in a quite hefty sum. And uh, with preventing uh, second class tomatoes uh, in one event, uh, you already pay, pay back all of your sensors. But uh, bad habits die hard, and the same customer, different year, same problem. Uh, that 
requires to have attention on what you are doing. Also here we see that EC continues uh, to increase uh, day by day and uh, you start to see again the same nice pattern of biomass increase at every irrigation. But now we already know that we need to act fast. And in this case, if you see that increase is, EC increase is happening, then the best case uh, is to lose a little bit money during the day if you can and irrigate with uh, more excessive uh, uh, drain during the sun when you cannot harm your plant because the plant is transpirating a lot and in this moment you can change e your EC in the substrate. So that would be the uh, best strategy to flush when you have a lot of light. So when, when there is sun there is more transpiration, that's the perfect time for flushing the substrate. And then uh, about the light. So basically what we are doing and who we are, all of us who are listening this presentation, the ones who are speaking, we are conversion of the sun. Uh, we are conversion of the free available energy. And this is also what we are doing in the greenhouse. We are converting light into something that we can eat or something that we can uh, uh, give as a present to other. And uh, we go to light measurements. So it is, uh, important to measure light with more than one sensor and the minimum sensors what I would recommend to use in the greenhouse if you measure inside of the greenhouse uh, would be not less than four and you should be measuring uh, in multiple places uh, because otherwise uh, you can be fooled by the amount of light what you have uh, because in this case what you see in this example uh, it have been sunny day which turned in cloudy day sensors in the greenhouse are placed in a grid pattern if we have a greenhouse which is a 4.5 meter wide uh, the post distance is 4.5 it's 8 meters wide and there have been uh, four rows in the greenhouse then we have placed our sensors uh, above every row in diagonal so we can measure above every row in different places because there is a shading of the construction and what you see here is that uh, one of the sensors catches light in the most uh, periods of the day and then there is some dips because of the construction which is shading off the light but many of those sensors get uh, shaded by uh, uh, just by glass because the uh, light angle so the the angle at which light shines on the glass is also proportional to light reflection and as uh, lower is the angle so as closer it is to zero as more light you reflect and as less light gets into the greenhouse so that's why you measure with more than one and you take the maximum to calculate uh, uh, the amount which goes through the glass and then you uh, subtract from that uh, the percentage which is blocked by the construction and the amount which is blocked by construction you can calculate by just taking your greenhouse plan and, and counting how many structures you have there per unit of uh, square meter and then that will be the amount what you would lose from the construction. So another uh, important factor is uh, that uh, you need to determine when to wash the roof. In our case, uh, in the greenhouse, which, I, which is close to, closest to me where I work uh, constantly, we have uh, uh, birds which make not even whitewash on the greenhouse and uh, constant light measurement gives us really good starting point when to wash the roof. And just one example on uh, how important it is to measure is that uh, on the 30th of March in 2020, when we started to work with uh, more than one power sensor, we saw that before roof washing it was uh, 1060 uh, micromoles and after, one, after it was uh, 1350. Keeping in mind that we have been measuring also artificial light, you need to keep in mind that artificial light measurement with sensors is a really bad idea uh, inside, uh, but that's why we have subtracted here the amount of light what we have been getting from artificial light and actually we have been losing 26 percent of sunlight so that's a lot you can see it and you can foresee when you need to uh, wash your roof because uh, one percent of light is up to one percent of production from 0 0.7 to one percent in production and then why it is bad idea to measure artificial light is because uh, then you need to have the perfect placement if you have your light plan and it says that you have 300 micromoles of light uh, or 400 micromoles as in our case. You need to know exactly where to place the sensor. We have placed in, in, in above 
like in around that place where we have the micromoles, but we are using that one only just to check how good our dimming is working. Is it working or is it not working? Because uh, we have our set point at which it should be dimming and then we see yes, natural light have been fluctuating, but actual artificial light inside of the green, so the total light some have been flat. And also you cannot measure interlight uh, with your bar sensor without making too many, uh, too many adjustments how to put it. And most importantly with light sensors, trust them, but uh, verify frequently because they can get dirty, dust can sit on them, uh, they can be bent, so a little inclination in angle will also show you different results. And uh, that was it. Hopefully you get something out of it. Uh, there will be a recording of this presentation, I think. Yes, right. there definitely will be a recording. Uh, we will definitely share it with everyone who has registered. Um, this will be also available on our Arena YouTube channel. But uh, thank you, Andres. I think this was very valuable insights and information to, I think, improve the daily growers' actions uh, in the greenhouse. And if anything was not understood, um, you can definitely reach out to Andres, uh, contact him personally, the contact details up on the last slide. And I think, um, yes, uh, stay tuned with this information, which is, I think, uh, a lot to learn. But we have also questions, Andres, a few of them being sent in. So in case anyone wants to um, ask anything also right now, you still can use the chat log for that. Um, but yeah, the first question, Andres, says, how do the RNA drain measuring and monitoring is used? Drain measuring and monitoring. Um, the, I suppose that it, uh, what it's meant with this question is how the spoon of the drain measurement is used. Uh, with that spoon, uh, uh, depends on specification. There can be or 10 or 5 millimeter per tick, a milliliter per tick. You calculate uh, your count of uh, pulses uh, with the drain, which have uh, yeah, count of pulses were with milliliters which is coming out, and then you know the volume which have been uh, dripping out. If you use the same sensor, uh, the same spoon also for monitoring the irrigation, then you can nicely see how much was the irrigation, and you could calculate the drain percentage. I hope that answers the question. Well, in case not, then uh, additional questions, so welcome. Um, the second question is, what is the optimal distance between sensors to accurately map the temperature and light distribution within a greenhouse? Uh, temperature, uh, definitely not less than 1,000 square meters per sensor. Uh, as more is better, but uh, 1,000 square meters would be the... Um, what we have seen is really relevant and uh, and good distance. Uh, for light sensors, uh, again, uh, it would be good to measure uh, only natural light, not artificial light, and then not less than four and equally spaced over, uh, over the roof pattern of the greenhouse. And uh, not less than four inside and one outside, just to compare how much is coming from outside to inside. Okay. What can damage temperature and weight sensors? Mm, definitely it can be spraying compounds, uh, the chemical compounds that you use uh, uh, with, for spraying for pests. Um, direct humidity, let's say water splashes or being too long in a too high relative humidity. If you put your uh, electronic sensor in 100% humidity, that's already mentioned in a specification of the sensor, then it will start to drift and it can be damaged. And then we need to talk about which damage. Um, I haven't seen in my experience, too many sensors which have been damaged that you couldn't use them, but uh, we have seen the temperature drift and humidity drift with the time. Uh, on weight sensors, you could see the you could see rust, but rust is a statical problem, not a physical problem. It doesn't affect the reading accuracy, and uh, you still use them. So we have the first sensors since 2018. Yeah, they look a bit worn, but that gives them a nice uh, little look. They have a little patina on them, but they still work perfectly. There's another one. Um, how to make sure that weight sensors are not influenced by temperature slash radiation to acquire accurate measurements? Well, that's uh, quite easy. Uh, you place them in your environment where you're going to be measuring the weight. 
you block them from influence of wind or uh, any other uh, physical movements, uh, vibration or others. And then you put static weight on them. Let's say you have 100 kilogram sensor, you put like 20 kilogram weight, the weight what you know. And then you observe over the time what's the, what's the change. So the specified change should be not more than 0.01% as far as I remember. So and then you should see whether it is affected or not. Okay, we have a few more questions. Uh, there's a question from Sergio. What are the recommendations about subflow sensor installation? What is the best place, bottom, mid or high, to put the subflow sensor? And how do you measure water in, water out with subflow sensor? Yeah, uh, this particular subflow sensor is meant for, thin, uh, for small diameters. It's simple to measure the subflow on a rose. It is simple to measure subflow in a fruit. Uh, it is simple to use the sub measure subflow in a leaf. And it is used as a clip. You put it as a clip on a uh, on place what you want to measure. And what you will see, you will not see the absolute flow. You could estimate the absolute flow. You will see the uh, rate of change of flow because uh, this sensor is based on a temperature difference. And you will say, uh, is there any difference in the subflow during the day or during the night, but not the absolute volume. Okay. We have a question from Joris. Um, how important is the light penetration into the crop, for instance, for tomatoes? And what setup would you propose to measure this? Um, well, depends on your budget. Uh, you could uh, go in a way that you measure every 10 centimeters one sensor, but that uh, comes at a hefty price. But uh, what we have been using in practice is that above in cucumber and tomato, we have a PAR sensor above the crop, uh, and then we have put the uh, PAR sensor in the projection of the crop wire and the crop underneath the crop. Just make sure that it's not covered with the leaves and uh, then we are uh, comparing the result from the top and from the bottom. Uh, the normal light use, uh, normal light absorption should be not less than 90%. And if you see that, let's say, above you measure your artificial light of uh, 200 micromoles and if you see that on the floor you see around uh, 20 micromoles, then you have sufficient leaf. If you have uh, less than that, then you could remove more leaf. And the easiest way is to measure above the crop and directly below the crop on the projection of the vertical. So on a vertical of, uh, of the crop wire underneath the crop. Okay. Um, there's a question from Maxim. What is optimal distance between leaf and IR sensor? Mm. Uh, that's a good one. Um, uh, definitely I suggest a more to use more than one uh, sensor, but uh, what you should keep in count that the sensor is looking at two degree angle. As further you go, as less certain you are which part of leaf it is measuring. Um, I would suggest not to go more than uh, 40 centimeters uh, above the leaf, uh, but also not less than 20 uh, because of the leaf movement. Uh, uh, the ones uh, who have access to internet, they could <laughs> see it in YouTube, how the plant is moving in my YouTube channel. We have done a lot of uh, videos of uh, plant movement and there you could see uh, that your measurement with this uh, sensor will be most precise if it is in a range from 40 to 20 centimeters from the crop, from the leaf. Okay, for now there are no more questions. Um, in case you have any questions, uh, feel free to send them in to us, to Arinet, or directly to, to Andres. And, uh, and yes, thank you everybody. Um, I think that we have done a great job here today, um, introducing these uh, tips and tricks um, and a lot of insights. And um, in case uh, you want to find out more, then um, you definitely can follow both of our social media. We are pretty active there on LinkedIn. Andres himself and Aronet, so Aronet Pro, um, search for it on LinkedIn. Our page is active with the content in diving into a lot of horticulture uh, topics. And stay tuned for the latest information of upcoming horticulture webinars, actually pretty near in May. So um, there will be a lot more news coming. 
And uh, yes. Thank you for, for joining us today.